my talk will be about the decentralized nut hole punching and um, especially about the uh, measuring the DCUTR success rate. Uh, DCUTR stands for direct connection upgrade through relays. And I will get to this in a second. Um, in this talk, I will briefly describe, well, not really briefly, but um, I will describe how the hole punching process works in the scope of um, Le Pier to Pier. And um, then we'll lie out how we um, how our measurement setup looks like and how we do how we want to measure the success rate of these hole punches. I will show some first results, but keep in mind they are not um, so this project is not as far along as the other two that we've seen so far. And at the end, I will just lay out some next steps. So hole punching. Um, first of all, a big shout out to Max, who has already done two excellent talks on hole punching. The first one is on, in FOSDEM. I highly recommend that one if you want to dive really deep into the technical details and in the protocols and so on. And another one in, uh, in Paris, where I've also was lucky enough to be um, part of this talk. So highly recommend both of them if we want to have more information than I'm about to present. So what's the motivation behind uh, hole punching? Um, we want to have full connectivity among all nodes of a lip peer to peer network despite nets and firewalls. And the requirements for us are we don't want to have any centralized infrastructure. It should work with QUIC and TCP and also maybe Web trend, uh, WebRTC. And it should nicely integrate into the um, lip peer to peer stack. So, um, in general, what are <laughs> nets and firewalls? Just a brief um, introduction. So nets map your local IP address to a public IP address and firewalls in general guard the access or like the incoming and outgoing network traffic from your home network or like from your local network to the internet. And firewalls usually do this with a, mm -hmm. something that they call a state table where they just um, yeah, enter a new row um, that takes the source IP address and source port and maps it to like the destination IP and destination port usually has also a state column, which is not depicted here, and also tracks the transport that's used. And the one of the most simple, um, or the, one of the simplest rules would be only let packets in if a previous, a previously um, a packet left the network. And so what's the problem with that in the, um, in the area of peer-to-peer -peer networks? So let's imagine peer A on the left-hand side wants to connect to peer B on the right-hand side. Um, PRA sends us, like in the, in the case of a TCP connection, a SYN packet um, to connect to B. And this packet reaches router A. Router A updates its own um, state table, as you can see at the bottom, with the internal IP address from a peer A on the left-hand side, the internal port. And it keeps track of the destination IP and destination port. And this packet leaves the router A. It's get routed through the internet. It reaches router B. And router B takes a look at its own state table and sees, well, I haven't sent anything out previously, and it will just drop the packet and won't let it through. We cannot connect. So that's the problem. Um, hole punching would work as follows. Um, let's imagine through some magical mechanism, both peers can synchronize a simultaneous connect. Um, this means, again, in the case of a TCP connection, both issue a, TC um, a SYN packet at the same time. Both routers update their own state tables the packets get um, routed through the internet, they cross path, they reach the um, other routers, and both routers look in their own state tables and see, well, I just sent out a packet. Um, I'm expecting a, um, another packet, so I left, let them through. Everything's good, and we are connected. Um, so as I said, we need some magical mechanism how both so this, this is hole punching in general. And we need now a, a, a process how both peers can synchronize. So how do they synchronize these simultaneous connects? And for this, um, I will now explain the DCUTR protocol. So this is what lip to peer uses to facilitate this, this hole punch mechanism. And um, for this, we need a relay which is publicly reachable. And um, so this works as follows. Peer B on the right-hand side um, first of all detects that it's behind a net and is not publicly reachable. It connects to a relay and um, requests something that's called, or reserves a, um, a spot on this, on this relay. The relay itself is just another um, Go IP, like in, another Kubo node. And uh, since um, Kubo 0 0.11, all the Kubo nodes are so-called limited relays. And a limited relay is something um, 
so this is, rolled, rolled, as I said, rolled out to all um, Kubo nodes since 0 0.11. And this means that um, like a limited relay only allows certain amount of resources to be shared. And in this case, I think it's like four megabyte of bandwidth. And this is all more, and, and also only a couple of protocols are allowed. But this is more than enough to facilitate this whole punch here. So um, Pure Beef searches for like any relay, any re limited relay, um, gets um, a reservation at this relay. That's how it's called. <clears throat> and also then um, has some um, a multi-address that looks like this. Um, this multi-address is passed to Peer A through some other means, or Peer A gets, gets to know this, this uh, other multi-address. And Peer A also connects to this relay and asks this relay, hey, can you, can you um, forward traffic for me to this Peer B? And with, in this case, right now, both peers are connected through this relay. And as soon as Peer B notices that Peer A has connected through this relay, Peer B looks at the multi-addresses of Peer A and tries it something that's called a connection reversal. So before we try to um, try this whole punch, we actually want to um, avoid this, this process and just try to directly connect. And only if this fails, Peer B actually um, starts with this DCUTR protocol. So this DCUTR protocol is, um, this is a, a stream that's opened. And peer B issues or like sends out the first message of this protocol, which is called a connect message. And this connect message contains all the publicly reachable IP addresses of peer B for the whole punch after, that will happen afterwards. So peer B sends out this connect message and starts a timer to measure the round trip time, which will uh, become um, important in a second. This connect me message gets routed through the relay, ends up at peer A. Peer A receives this connect message and sends it's another connect message back. This, co this connect message in turn contains the multi addresses of peer A, like the, the, the publicly reachable ones, like pu public IPs and poor. This connect message then reaches B and B stops the timer. And now B knows the round trip time between both. And after the connect message has um, reached B, B sends the second type of message in this protocol, which is a sync message. And the sync message gets forwarded while peer B waits half the round trip time that was previously measured. And in theory, the sync message should reach peer A exactly after half the round trip time. And as soon as either half the round trip time in case of B or the sync message was received from peer A, um, any of these events have occurred. Both start this whole punch as previously. They try to connect each other simultaneously. The routers update their state tables. They pass paths somewhere in the internet, not depicted here right now. The packets uh, pass through both routers. They look at the state tables, everything's fine, and both are connected. So this is like, in a nutshell, how this, um, yeah, how this whole punch or like this um, direct connection upgrade through relay protocol works. As I said, Max has a more thorough um, talk about all of the, uh, the details and the protocol itself and also the limited relay, so I highly recommend uh, to look at this at one of his talks. All right, so this is now deployed. Um, so how do we measure it? Um, and if I said it's deployed, we can have a look at the agent version uptake. Janis also uh, already showed one of these graphs earlier today. This is um, one of the more recent um, time frames here. Um, so we have the on the x-axis, we have the date, and on the y-axis, the number of DHT server peers. And each line corresponds to one of these um, most recent agent versions from 0 0.14 to 0 0.10. And as we can see, after the Go, it still says Go IPFS, but after Kubo version 0 0.13 was released, there's a steady increase of um, DHT server peers. And this roughly corresponds to a rate of one um, new DHT server peer per hour. And our first idea was we could just use this. So this is from um, also from network crawls. We could just use these network crawls and the peers that we detect through these crawls to just hole punch them. Every um, yeah, every, every time we detect a new one, we can just um, like try to hole punch them and try to um, create a direct connection. However, these are, DHT, as I said, DHT server peers, and they are already publicly reachable. And so we need an, a way to find peers that are behind nets, which is actually quite hard to do because they, we cannot reach them and we can actually not see them from the internet. And for this, um, 
We have another setup, uh, which I will get to in a second. Um, we have this repository here. Um, we called this project, or not project, but this repository puncher. You can find all the components that I'm about to present in this, uh, in this repository and also um, yeah, look around the code and so on. Um, everything that I'm about to present is there, also the analysis code and uh, yeah. So the components um, for our measurement setup consist of a honeypot, a server, and a set of clients. And I think maybe the most interesting ones, uh, one is the honeypot. Um, as I said, we cannot see peers behind nets. So we need a way to attract peers behind nets to connect to us so that we can detect them and uh, can try to uh, yeah, facilitate a hole punch with them. So these honeypots are just usual DHT server peers. Um, that we are currently running on uh, on one of our servers. They what, what, the only thing that they do is they announce it's they, themselves. Well, we had only have one, so this honeypot only announces itself to the network, and it does that by walking the DHT. This means um, the same me methodology that the crawler is using. So it's just enumerating the DHT quite slowly, and it's a very stable peer. And the hope is that we pass by every DHT server peer in the network, and since we are stable, we get like the honeypot gets inserted into the routing tables of these other remote peers so that when peers behind nets want to interact with the DHT, they get routed to our honeypot. And this way we can, over time, get to know a lot of clients that are behind nets. So that's the idea. And this honeypot, if it detects an inbound connection, it just saves us to a data database. And um, then we have the server component. This server component just exposes a gRPC API, and it exposes a couple of yeah a couple of API endpoints. And the most important ones are the query and track endpoints. That's how I would call them. So you could query the server for um, or the and the server queries the database for these peers that we have detected that are behind nets. And um, after we have done a hole punch or performed a hole punch, we can also track the results back. And then the clients, on the other hand, we have one in Rust and one in Go. And another shout out again to Max and also Elena, who is working, uh, who has been working on these um, on the Rust implementation of these clients. Um, these clients connect to the server, and um, we would like to, or at, at least I'm currently running one of these clients on my home network, and this client is connecting to the server, requesting peers to hole punch. It tries to connect um, to, to, to these peers that are behind nets. And if this was successful or not, it just re, um, reports back the, um, the outcome of this whole punch. The architecture roughly looks like this. Um, as I said, the honeypot walks the DHT. And by walking the DHT, we're increasing the chance that peers, uh, DCGR capable peers behind nets connect to the honeypot. As soon as we get the inbound connection, it saves the connection to the database, and the server just exposes the data from the database to the clients, and the clients actually do the whole punches um, and report back the outcomes. Did I forget any, something? I don't think so. Yeah. OK, and yeah, we are, we are monitoring all of that. Um, well, we are not monitoring the clients um, specifically, but the honeypot and the server component. And um, yeah, you can find it's publicly accessible. You can find it under this URL on the right hand side. Um, this is yeah, just, just a, um, mo the most up-to-date view on how everything performs. And this brings me then to some of the first results. But as I said, keep in mind, I'm just running uh, one of these clients in my home network. And it's probably, uh, so it's, there, there's much, m much more work to do to get a more comprehensive view of the network, uh, but still. So this um, shows the incoming connections per hour um, to the honeypot right now. And if we are really brave, we can also put a linear fit through this. And we can also see that um, the number of incoming connections increases over time, which is expected as 0.13 is rolled out uh, into the network. And as we can see, we, can, we have roughly 300, 350 uh, new clients per hour um, that connect to, to the honeypot, which we can then use to, yeah, to, try, to try to hole punch. The conditions are that this, the clients are, support the um, DCOTR protocol and that they actually listen on a relay. So these are the two conditions for, for that. And now I think probably the most interesting graph is how successful is that. Um, as I said, 
it's just running on my own personal home network and I'm um, this client on my home network has performed roughly 13,300 hole punches to two and a half thousand unique peers. So every peer was roughly hole punched five times probably. And the, yeah, the success rate is around 72%, while 28% have failed, which is not as good as Max has, for instance, reported in the FOSDEM um, presentation. There he um, reported um, a success rate of 90%. But I think, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the measurement setup that uh, he, he was reporting on, the, um, but I think they, it was a little bit more controlled than this one. This is actually the success rate to like random peers in the whole IPFS network. And I think if you take this uh, into account, this is already a pretty good um, success rate, in my opinion. But yeah, we can talk about this afterwards. And I think also another interesting result already. Um, so if the so we are trying to hole punch as at, um, another peer, but if the first direct connection fails, we actually try it a second time and a third time, and only then we stop this um, this hole punch attempt. And as and this shows this graph that we could actually stop after the first attempt. So in 97% of the cases, the first attempt, if the hole punch was successful, it was successful within the first attempt. And only 2.3% and 0.4% were successful with the second try or the third try. So you could argue that if it doesn't work the first time, it won't work the second or third time uh, either. So how long does the... Um, such a hole punch take. Um, yeah, the, the median is like roughly 0 0.9 seconds and the 90th percentile is 1.7 seconds or um, 99th percentile around 8 seconds. Um, I just put it here because I've got the data. Um, probably, yeah, but yeah, this, this accounts to the, um, to the connection establishment. So this could become a, yeah, interesting if, if performance becomes a problem at some point. And also, this is a quick graph that I created yesterday, which um, takes into account the round trip time measurement and how successful it is depending on the round trip time measurement. So I could imagine that um, if I wanted to hole punch a peer, so I'm not right now in Iceland, if, and if I wanted to hole punch another peer also in Iceland, but the relay peer is, for instance, somewhere in Australia, we have a very long round trip time and the measurement of the round trip time may be subject to a lot of network jitter or, or whatnot. And so that the synchronization doesn't really work that well if the round trip time is very high. So I just looked at the um, round trip time measurement and um, just looked at in which cases um, this hole punch was successful or failed. And we can see that I don't think it's statistically uh, significant, but we, like there's a tendency of um, if the round trip time is a little higher, then the chances that the hole punch fails is also a little higher, but um, not as pronounced as I um, would expect it to be. And with that, um, the next step would be just to dig deeper into the data. Um, we want to have, uh, we want to know the dependence on TCP and quick connection upgrades, uh, quick hole punches. Uh, we also want to compare the Go and Rust implementation a little more. And also, when we deploy more clients to the network, or well, to, to home networks, we also want to, um, we want to let those clients to hole punch each, each other so that we have the control about both parts of the, um, of the hole punch uh, peers. And we, as, yeah, this implies that we want to deploy the clients to multiple or more vantage point as right now. I'm just running one, and you can see these results were only from my own uh, client. And with that, there's a call out, so please participate. There's a formula, it's not formula, there's a form, a Google form that you can fill in. And um, after you've filled in this form, you will receive an API key from me and you can download the um, client binaries from this uh, GitHub repository that I've showed earlier. And then you can run this, for instance, on your Raspberry Pi at home or somewhere else. And uh, yeah, just participate in this measurement campaign and this would be great um, if we get got more data. This form will ask you for some stuff like what router are you using and what the network topology looks like if you have something to tell. And um, yeah, because this whole punch success rate um, depends a lot on the type of net that's using and the, that the router is using. So having information about that will um, help us later on in the data analysis. Does it have to be running 24-7 or can I run it just for two hours? 
You, I think you can also run it just for two hours. I'm running it 24-7 for the last, I don't know, nine days or so. Um, but yeah, you, or even if you just can participate a couple of hours worth of data, I think it's, it's worth it. So yeah, so, um, and that's it, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you say that if the node is failing, uh, if you try again, there's a very low percent uh, success rate. Yeah. Um, do we try again using the same relay, or do we try again using a different one? We try again with this with the same relay in this case. So maybe <coughs> so as you said, if you're here in Iceland and trying to all punch in Iceland and going through New Zealand, mm. so maybe if on the second attempt I would try to change the relay. It could maybe increase the, 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 the rate for the second attempt. Right, yeah, totally. Um, this is something that I wanted to show with this graph. That So, th so this, um, this would be true if, if the assumption holds that if we have a long round trip time that the success rate is lower. But this graph, as I said, implies that. But it's not very, very clear that it's actually the case. Um, oh, we could yeah. Try. yeah, yeah, you, you, definitely. You, we, we, could, we could try, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Janet. Uh, what is the possible cause for some for this to fail? Like, um, is it so? I would imagine that there is a discrepancy between the uh, in the RTP uh, measurements mm -hmm. and then the buckets don't fall like don't cross at the same time. Right. And probably this is going to be connection to exactly this would be yeah. one one possible so cause. It, yeah. Is there a way to I don't know make that measurement more, um, uh, more accurate, perhaps, or, or even like try to dive deeper into, you know, in these failure cases, it has been, uh, has been a discrepancy between the equity measurements of the two peers and when they started sending their SIM buckets, mm -hmm. and that's why it eventually failed. Right. Um, obviously, the longer the delay, the further away the nodes are, or not, yeah. maybe higher the chances that there is going to be uh, that's more in inaccurate, you mean? Or? Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe it yeah, I, I, I was also about to say that maybe it's also the, yeah, the opposite. I don't know. The thing with these attempts is that um, each attempt has its own round trip time measurement. So um, we've already got three me uh, round trip time measurements. So the first with the first attempt, um, we are doing this connect, connect, sync thing and got one round trip time measurement. And then we've try a whole punch. If this doesn't work, we do the whole thing again. Connect, connect, run to time measurement. And um, yeah. And it, 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 it seems like if it doesn't work the first time, it won't work the other two times. Yeah. And if for measuring the RPC between the two remote nodes, instead of going through the relay, so you cannot ping the other node, but you can try to ping its route, and it would give a good information that on the actual RPC between the two. Not going through the relay, right? Not, ah, right, okay. But so the, the router may not answer, but most of the router, I think. But then, but then okay, so then I know the, the, the ping to the router, but then I need to to inform the other peer when the other peer should start the um, should start the connect process. Um, and this, this, and this again needs to go through the relay then. Yeah, yeah. But at least you have a more accurate RP. <coughs> but yeah, my, so so my, my communication has to go through the relay. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. Even if I knew the the ping to this to the router, I don't think this will bring the, this will help me much because because of the synchronization. So I still need to. So how long should I wait for the sync passive package then to reach the other peer again? So. So you know the the RTT from uh, router A to router B through the relay. The RTT ah, through the relay. The, no. Or yes. So you know the RTT from A to B. Or A to the relay, relay to B, right. and A to B, and so you can do easy arithmetic to. Ah, you can, okay. I but I so how should I know the the delay from router A to the relay in this case? Router A to the relay can just ping the relay. I mean, this is all like from the perspective of B in this case. So okay. B, 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 B can uh, measure the, the um, latency to the relay and to the router, router A, and also th to peer A through the relay. These are the three things that could be measured, I think. And it has to tell A when to, like, the right time to send it back. Exactly, yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, please. Um, so it, with the, the Kubo 13 update, is this only realized when the node behind the firewall or the NAT is on 13, or do both peers have, does everybody have to be on 13? Um, but both both parties need to be need to be in thirteen <clears throat> because both need to support the the D, it's slash lib P2P slash DCUTR um, protocol and both both peers need to support this protocol um, for this to work. Does yeah. the relay as well? The relay yeah. itself needs to be the um, a limited relay and this relay should support the circuit V two um, protocol. Sorry. Yeah, the... exactly. And the, I was about. To, yeah, exactly. And this was rolled out with um, zero point eleven already. So this is already around for quite some time. Yeah. Thank you. You also showed a, a graph that about seventy five percent success rate. Um, good. Do you guys have any idea what the other twenty five percent may be failing with? What do you mean? Which which, which graph? Uh, I think you were just on it. Yep. Oh, that one. Yeah, that one right there. So why the 28% fail, you mean? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious if you guys have any like, next targets you're trying to hit here, or you know, what could cause those to fail? Um, yeah, exactly. So this is the, these would be the next steps, just to, to find out why these fail. And like this also, I think, what you, Janus, asked, the, some failure reasons. And I can imagine that, so some, some nets actually don't allow hole punching. Like if you, have, if you are behind a symmetric net, for instance, this won't work. And um, Yes, some other reasons, as we just discussed, could be the RTT measurement, which is not not quite accurate, and not running it only from your yeah, not not running it only from my home <laughs> and and extrapolating to the whole network uh, would also be something that uh, yeah could change these results. And uh, but I mean, um, I think also Yanis, you also said, said this a couple of times. This could be a game changer, being able to connect directly to peers behind nets in the in, in the peer to peer world, and already having. 72% from my from my network right now is is I think pretty good and from now on I think we can only yeah go go beyond the 72% by analyzing these failure reasons so pretty good already just a personal opinion here right when 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 the connect uh, port punching is successful mm -hmm. uh, I think we should in one of the next slides how long does it take this one ah so okay. Yeah, so these are the connection establishment times. <clears throat> in case so, of success? Uh, I think so. Yeah, it should, okay. should be in case of success, yeah. And okay, it would be nice <coughs> to uh, differentiate like when it fails. When it fails, how long does it, it yeah. fail? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Something that's not shown here. So this measures the time from the um, opening the DCUTR stream to the actual, actual successful hole punch or like actual direct connection. Um, if if I take a look at the times from having a connection through the relay until we actually have upgraded the connection to a um, direct connection through a hole punch, we can see that um, this graph basically starts just after five seconds, which means that um, something that I just mentioned briefly earlier, um, when peer A connects, oh, hang on, uh, here we go. <laughs> So peer A connects to peer B through this relay, and peer B notices that, and immediately starts to directly connect to A without starting this whole punching process. Because before we try to, just peer B just tries to directly connect to peer A with the um, publicly reachable IP addresses, and then eventually times out. And I think for the TCP and quick transport, the um, timeouts are five seconds. And only after this timeout, um, PRB starts this whole process by opening this DCOTR stream and sending the connect messages and so on. And this is also something that I saw in, um, yeah, in, in the data, which is just not, um, oh, sorry, not depicted here. Uh, hang on. And uh, which could be something that um, instead of waiting for this direct connection to succeed or, or fail in this case, uh, we could also just start the hole punch directly and wait and race race the direct connection in this case could be another optimization yeah um, how do you say this might change or evolve with like the evolution of transport on like IP address 
evolution of transport, you mean no, like TCP like, 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 like this is very useful like TCP, like, 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 like WebSocket, like, which is like different transport companies, and this might be less relevant, but like have a different. I hope I got this correct, but um, I think um, so. S some of the stuff that we want to analyze is the TCP and Quick um, success rate, because in Quick you're sending mm -hmm. UDP packets and uh, NETs and firewalls behave differently by with updating the state tables. So there's certain so well not certainly because we have not measured it, but I can imagine that there's a um, a difference in success rates depending on whether you use TCP and Quick, and this is something that we want to analyze definitely, and also WebRTC and. I don't know, web transport maybe as well, yeah. So we need to look into that. And I can imagine that the success rates are different. And then if we find out that they are different, we could prioritize either over the, over the other later on. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm <coughs> wondering if you uh, publish the data. Uh, Sorry, say that again. Uh, did you publish the data? On, uh, it's it's not yet published. I'm I'm happy to do if you're interested in. Um, so the um, these components. So the database itself is just a Postgres database. So the data is highly normalized, and the schema is all on on the GitHub repository. The data itself is just on a server that we are running. And so if if you're interested, I'm I'm happy to dump the data. And I think if we want to. Um, package this up into like a, a publication, we would also, like into, into a scientific publication, we would also publish the data sets as well. So, but it's not on the, on GitHub right now. Um, I was also curious about the like miniature relays. Um, as in, do you collect data on like uh, the number of relays and the versions? You mean how many um, of these limited relays are in the network already? Um, this is roughly visible in this graph. So as uh, Joropo said already, uh, since 0 0.11, we've got this limited relay capability. And I can imagine if you add up the numbers um, from 0 0.11 to 0 0.14, you get a pretty accurate number of how many relay servers there are in the network already. And this goes up to, I don't know, a couple of, a few thousand probably, maybe two or three thousand, four, roughly like that. So plenty, I would argue. And again, fill out this form, participate in the measurement campaign. Um, yeah. Also get access to data if we uh, join the. <laughs> if if you, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, we can do this as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.